So I try and give a little talky bit that makes some links. And um, the things that have come together for me this week actually are memory and emotion, memory and emotion. Now, part of it was because I said to uh, one of my nephews that um, we've got Chris with us this week, a musician. And my nephew's instant response was, how do they remember all the words? when they're singing all their songs. And it made me think, well, of course, music and emotion and memory and words, you can always remember the words of a lovely song. And I think there's a link there. Particularly Up the Junction, which is uh, not only one of the greatest songs ever made, but it's quite hard to memorise. <laughs> well, we cannot, you can pick that up with Chris, whether he ever got his own words at, at, at some other point. Um, but of course, it's also, you know, in the news, there's been a lot of emotion featuring conflicting memories, if I dare go there. We've had Meghan and Harry, of course. Um, but also, in the UK at least, um, Piers Morgan, one of several emotional men who actually make very good broadcasters. And I think it's because their projected opinions give us the sort of instant pleasure of having an opinion about them back as well. So it's been quite um, a week of, of, of emotion and memory. I mean, I was just thinking about this a bit more and it also made me wonder whether it's why people tend to get very fixed opinions about figures like, say, Piers Morgan, or, you know, conversely, figures like Donald Trump. Um, I think it's because they're kind of, you have this instant emotional response to them that then tends to fix your memory of them. And it's very hard to kind of change that or have it changed for you. Um, anyway, memory and emotion, and they're very linked, of course, hence the words in a song that you remember. Um, I work as a psychotherapist and um, traumatic memory um, is often blocked because of the emotion associated with trauma. And it's like having tunnel, vi tunnel vision when you go into a panic. Um, and so memory recall is often a measure of trauma that's getting resolved. It's quite remarkable. People start to remember what happened. Um, and, uh, you know, emotion and memory then becomes positively linked, rather kind of obliterating things. Um, it's, it's also actually, interestingly, as a therapist, why you never actually have trouble remembering what's important because the important things are those which have emotional significance and so it's amazing what you remember about people in fact just coming into their presence brings all sorts of things that otherwise you might struggle to remember they just come back to mind um, it's the same phenomenon you know everyone knows where they were when they heard about 9-11 or when Princess Diana died um, those kind of memories stick when they've got that quality of emotion to them um, it's also why though people do forget what happened and hence, you know, the conflicting memories perhaps of events um, that have been rehearsed in the media this week, um, because um, emotion does color memory too. And um, people can very dramatically disagree actually, um, even if they were at precisely the same event. And in, in couples therapy, it's often a breakthrough when this is acknowledged and people recognize that their memory might be quite as shaped by their emotion in the moment as the person they're trying to communicate with. And when that's acknowledged, it often makes for a breakthrough. You know, it also made me think about, I don't know, the dreariness of lockdown. And maybe it's to do with whether you've been suffering kind of emotional turbulence on the one hand with the lockdown or kind of emotional emptiness on the other hand. And this sort of blurs our memory into a kind of gray week after week, month after month. And I guess it's part of the reason why we're longing for the lockdown to ease because then our emotional lives will pick up that bit more and we'll have sort of real memories again and um, not this strange blur of the last months. Anyway so my tip for making the world a better place this week is to forgive people for misremembering whether they're known to you or whether they're blazed across the media. It may well be the emotion of the moment and um, it may be that they're a bit hysterical like Piers Morgan or your Twitter enemy for that matter. And then my happiness tip how to make you feel a bit happier is to memorize a poem. Interesting, this is actually a tip that Plato suggested, a bit like memorizing a song. And the reason is because you get a dose, and, a dose of emotion in the effort to memorize it as well. There's sort of two things come together. It's a bit, you get a good bit of vicarious emotion. And hence, I think that's often why people say it's a good thing to memorize a poem um, because you get this sort of rich experience from it. Um, or, of course, just play a song and sing along to it until you know it by heart. Tom, good tips for you? 
Well, they are brilliant chips, and um, I've actually been doing those. I do those a lot anyway. I've been learning some poetry off by heart. I, I won't try and recite it now. Twas brillig, and the slithy toves did gar and gimble in the wave. Okay, um, enough of my yakking, as they say in this final chap. Chris, are you there? Yes, here I am. Now, Chris, have you, what are your, you know, therapies? Have, have you, we're just talking to a, a shrink there. Have you, have you done much therapy over the years? Or what do you do to sort of keep sane? Well, songwriting is very much a therapy for me. Um, I take time to observe my feelings and uh, I spend hours sometimes writing down how I feel and then they become lyrics for songs. But as far as therapy is concerned, I've been in therapy for many years, Hi. various people. And uh, I have to say it's a journey that um, I've found worthwhile and uh, I keep coming back because there's so much to learn as you get older. So you don't have this thing where, um, you know, the therapy takes away some of the energy that might have gone into your creative work? No, not at all, because I think that the songwriting, the lyric writing is from the subconscious or parts of the subconscious. It's like a little sponge in there that soaks up the words and the images, the conversations. Whereas therapy and, and the energy around that comes more from an emotional um, part of the brain where there's more, f more uh, attached feelings, I guess. And uh, during lockdown, there's been plenty of opportunity to tap into that. Now, where, where are you now? Because you're in a lovely uh, space. Is it, is it your office or a, a shed or a studio? This is my shed and uh, it is where I have everything I've ever written, my lyrics, my diaries from 1970, 73 onwards. My, and um, this is really where, where I suppose I am. This is where I am. It, it, looks, it looks like a sort of a, a man paradise to me. Is the rest of the family allowed in? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, they 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 um when we when we rebuilt the cottages that we're in, they just, we ran out of rooms, and so I said, well, where am I going to work? You know, so they so it was decided that I would take uh, a route to the end of the garden below where the rooks live, and uh, that's where I am. Oh, well, it sounds so nice. How long have you been there? Uh, how old are the kids now? Who's in your Who's been in your lockdown situation for the last? Well, 12 months, I suppose, on and off. Well, my grown-up children are all over the place, New York and London and Dublin. Um, my wife's children, my stepchildren, two of them are here and they're in, um, they've been homeschooling. And, but now this week is the first time they've gone, gone back. So there's been a bit of fresh air around the house. Have you thought about writing a, a song about homeschooling? Because that would be quite good. Hmm. No. Uh, what I've been writing about recently is nothing to do with lockdown at all. It's, it's been <laughs> more about therapy. Now, we were. Uh, well, I was going to ask you earlier, Chris, um, about having teenagers in the house. And I've just been rereading your fantastic uh, autobiography, Some Fantastic Place, which came out about three years ago. And if anyone hasn't read it, do pick it up. I mean, it's, it's so warm and funny. Um, and uh, despite being one of the greatest lyricists of his generation, or probably the best in the 80s and 90s, um, Chris is extremely self-effacing all the way through, and it's, it's, uh, that makes it a very, very funny read. Now, I'm just looking at the bit um, uh, which we published on the Idler website this week, Chris, where you talk about your relationship with your parents. Um, in fact, yeah, you, you sort of got a job at one point. Uh, you, you know, it, it was a bit of a sort of quadrophenia story. That's what it made me think of, you know. Um, I don't know how old you were, but, you know, wh what would have happened to Squeeze if you had been in lockdown and you'd been stuck with your parents? Can you imagine it, like, at the age of 17, 18, 19, which is when you sort of got going? Well, I was living on a council estate in South London, and I don't think we would have survived lockdown very well. Um, my parents were from another generation, and I don't think they could have handled it at all. 
they would have turned to the drink possibly um, and my single room was smaller than this shed and I don't think I could have lasted a year in it but um, who knows I mean it could have been a very creative time it was a very creative time actually and I, I when the first lockdown came last March or April whenever it was it felt like an adventure to me and it reminded me of the 1970s the very early 1970s when there wasn't very much to do apart from lay on the floor giggle smoke dope and write songs and listen to Stevie Wonder and um, just explore the mind you know and that's kind of a lovely thing so I've locked down the first lockdown was an adventure going back to the 1970s this one however has been a little bit more challenging <laughs> challenging is an excellent word um but so what you're really saying is that it's you know it your creativity comes out of idling comes out of having that time just to sort of do nothing and drift i take a lot from our conversations and when i first started reading about what you write and the idler and what you promote and i have to say that for me to become a lyricist i have to idle and sometimes um, one's family doesn't understand that so you can be looking into the near distance and they will say to you what are you doing and you say well i'm writing a lyric and they say well it looks like you're just staring off into the into a fog and i said that's exactly what i'm doing i'm <laughs> idling because i need to access that part of the brain that where all the information is the imagery is the imagination is and to do that you need to rest you need to idle and that's really the root of uh and that's really what you're talking about in the book when you talk about the period where you had this um steady job and you say my parents were happy i was looking smart and i was, I was bringing money home um but that that job had quite a dramatic ending to it didn't it it did i was a solicitor's clerk in those days strangely enough and i enjoyed my job i used to go into london carrying briefs for um various judges and so on and, and barristers one of them was very lovely indeed her name was valerie Morantz, and i used to get off on the fact that i carried her briefs around the the uh, the temple bar um but yeah i i became attracted to uh drugs i suppose and uh, I didn't have a lot of money and one they trusted me with the keys of the building and one night after a few drinks in the local pub I broke into our office broke into the safe stole everybody's wages and they didn't see me again and what sorry what did you do with this uh, pile of cash that you had buy a scooter oh I just went over the bar Chinese food takeaways fish and chips I mean it wasn't a very glamorous thing <laughs> it, it would have been Uber Eats today no and I was uh, you know I, I felt terrible about it I have to say the following day it was one of those things just a few drinks and, and looking at the keys in my pocket thinking this is the keys to the kingdom but it wasn't your dad had to return the money he must have been a bit upset I guess my father was really upset he got a letter from the lady that ran the solicitors company and saying that it was a coincidence that i'd phoned in sick for three weeks and that the safe had been emptied and that i had the keys and was it me <laughs> <laughs> uh, before calling the police can you just put your hand up so i put my hand up and um, my dad paid it all off bless him but you didn't go back no that it kind of went all a bit sour then my parents asked me what i wanted to do with my life and i said i want to be in a band and they said you'll end up an alcoholic and a drug addict and they were completely right <laughs> uh, um, you know they they saw all of that coming and then i dropped out and became a sort of hippie i suppose i went off to somerset and devon and just sort of laid about in the grass but, but was that quite unusual at that time um for someone with a sort of working class background really to enter bohemia uh was there quite a lot of it about i suppose it was you were that's kind of what punk was it was a, a sort of route to um 
bohemian living, you know, not, not working for a living and so on, uh, which had previously been a bit of a sort of middle class um, luxury, I suppose. But I, mm. you know, punk seemed to open that up to a much wider range of people. Well, this was pre-punk. This was kind of like the big, like, I suppose it was around 1970. It was when Glastonbury first launched in fact as a fest festival well so this is more like um what how old were you at this, at this point 17 18 okay so it's more like sort of bell bottoms pink floyd bell bottoms tank top um and roll your own cigarettes that sort of thing drinking cider and a friend of mine who was a drug dealer in soho in fancy so soho he had a london taxi uh, that he'd bought second hand and we used to drive around in that i used to sit in the back and we drove to the glastonbury festival in that in that and um in those days you were lucky enough to drive right up to stonehenge and sleep outside stonehenge in the car which is what we uh, did and it was the most amazing thing and um, drugs were involved at that point, you know, um, psychedelic drugs, I imagine. Probably. Now, so t tell us about how you actually got the band going. Because, I mean, for us, you know, for me, um, uh, Squeeze were such a big part of my life, you know, when I was when I was growing up. Um, it, it seems incredible that you actually, you know, made it happen and were, were, were sort of so successful. Um, and again, I was reading the bit about uh, Top of the Pops, which which is great. But uh, and Jules Holland was in the band at the beginning, of course. I mean, how on earth did, did you get it together? And also to create what I think is, uh, I mean, it's a very unpretentious band. But actually, the sound and the the, the lyrics and the song structures are, are quite unusual and very original. They are very original. I think that's a combination of myself and Glenn. I mean, he's. A genius at what he does. He's a great writer, producer, uh, all round good person. And um, sometimes we'd be in the rehearsal room, and songs would seem extremely complex. But we we didn't really want to change and be like everybody else. We just wanted to be like us, so we just stuck at it. Really, um, we were listening to people like Sparks, for instance, and Todd Rudgren. Um, but then on the other hand we were listening to boogie woogie music because jules was in the in the band so we had a wide spectrum you know and and we we paid our dues we toured for quite a few years before we got a record deal um and really that's not what bands do anymore you know bands don't do that so much anyway and we spent the best part of three months in america before we kind of managed to knock on any door there it was really hard work but it was great fun um and the combination of us as characters was quite interesting because we all pulled in different directions together if that makes sense um but we were never fashionable like duran duran thank god but 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 we were we were just stuck to our uh, guns i mean you, you did actually, you, you often say that but you, you did have quite a good sense of style it was um I mean, it's not like you wore matching clothes, uh, no, but Duran no. Duran actually took the piss out of your uh, sort of what they saw as a lack of style, didn't they? Yeah, they didn't think we were very, we saw them on top of the pops once, they didn't think we were very fashionable. And Jules went up to Simon Le Bon just before he went on camera and said, excuse me, um, Mr. Le Bon, your collar's sticking up. It just won't do. And he said, that's called fashion. You wouldn't understand. What a wanker. <laughs> um, but I mean, Squeeze were like a million times cooler at the time than Duran Duran. I mean, certainly for me and my friends, it was totally uncool to like Duran Duran, although little bits of their fashion mm. uh, sense might have kind of drizzled down like bleached hair or whatever. <laughs> Possibly. I mean, they, you know, that was n not really music I listened to, but, you know, I, I was I was more into Ian Dury and the Blockheads, Elvis Costello, and people like that. Mm -hmm. And can you remember, um, I'm sorry, you told this story millions of times, but um, I was just thinking before we went in, I'd love to hear it again, how Up the Junction was written. Because again, it's it's actually a very unusual song. It doesn't really have a chorus. Um, no. uh, it tells a story. It's, it's uh, it, you know, 
every time you listen to it, it sort of sends shivers down, down your back. Um, and it's very exciting, but it's it's about, you know, it's, it's quite a depressing situation, really. How, yeah, how did yeah. that come into your head? I think you weren't even in the UK at the time. Well, um, touring America was exhausting, but fun. Um, we were all bundled in a Chevy van uh, with no air conditioning. And we toured around for the best part of three months playing every dive you can imagine. Um, when we got to New Orleans, we couldn't afford to stay in the city itself. So we had to stay on the outskirts and we stayed at the Rip Van Winkle Hotel, which was out by the freeway. And one morning I was doing my laundry and I was watching my t-shirts and underpants flying around and I really missed home. I started crying and thinking, well, London is where I should really be. And I started writing the lyrics to Up the Junction and they just came in one, one sort of most good, so most great songs that or good songs that I've written have come in one sitting if you like, I seldom go back and edit. And so that just came and um, it didn't have a chorus. Glenn didn't put, put a chorus to it. Our manager said it would never be a hit because it didn't have a chorus. But luckily our record company, A&M, um, were a bit more open-minded and they gave it a go and it was a hit. Yeah, we, we remember. Um, <laughs> and it became, uh, with, there's so many other songs as well, but. But you, also, you said that okay. So you, you had this kind of, kind of um, uh, you know the, the song rushed into your head. But had you at some level been turning it over this idea, you know, in in your thinking? Before? No, no. No, I, I, when I write, like for instance, this week when I've been writing here on in my shed, um, I just have to wait for the ideas to come to me. I don't go chasing them, making notes and being really involved in the storyline. I just wait for them to come. And if they don't come, sometimes I get frustrated, but more often than not, I just let that happen. And I have to say that when they do come and they're really good, like one came last week, just completely out of the blue called I Came to Believe. And uh, when I wrote it down, I just went, and when I got to the end of writing it down, I just went, OK, I've nailed that one. I don't need to change anything. So it, 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 I'm sure all writers have the same kind of um, 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 participation in self. Yeah, but you must have to sort of, I mean, don't you have some sort of a working routine? I'm going to go and sit in my shed for a certain amount of hours quietly. Um, and even if half the time is bumbling around, you know, you need some sort of discipline or you need some sort of uh, yes. quiet space, you know. I agree. Um, and that's what's been lacking during lockdown is that I haven't been able to, I've been teaching songwriting for um, since May of last year for various charities like help musicians mainly. And I get 14 writers and um, we break off into groups and at the end of the week I'm exhausted by it and then I realise I haven't written anything myself which is odd so um, the discipline I don't have for me but I have it for everybody else um, but it, it hopefully it will return uh, the golden hours for me are just after dinner for like two or three hours to sit in here and when it's dark everybody's gone or going to bed dogs are asleep the rooks have started stopped making a bloody racket and i'm just here there's a, somebody on the screen here i can see is that not harvey no there you go there you go you're you're uh, back sorry oh, is that right yeah yeah so so yeah i mean the discipline i wish i had more connection with that at the moment and um hopefully it will take place yeah so it sounds like you've been pretty busy under lockdown then um, with the with your with, with your teaching. And by the way, I think Victoria mentioned Chris did a lovely course for us at the Idaho Academy, um, which again, I think you, you really encourage people to sort of uh, sort of relax and let go and um, yeah. sort of flow access to subconscious. Yeah, well, the, the wonderful thing about help musicians and it's open to the public as well um is 
that everybody's in lockdown nobody's got any work stages are dark you can't perform so people are looking for things to do and a lot of people have suffered depression anxiety anxiety people have been thinking about doing other jobs like amazon drivers or whatever mm. and that's very frustrating when you've got so much talent and um so during the week i have a get to know you day on a monday then i put people in groups tuesday wednesday and then we have fun on thursday and then on a saturday i do a charity zoom every other saturday to raise money for different people last weekend we did a charity for um, event for the Tarrytown Music Hall in New York, which is the last place that Squeeze played before lockdown. It's a small theater. We raised $10,000 that ev evening. And since lockdown, we've raised nearly £50,000 for various charities just by me sitting in this shed, which is an extraordinary thing. And um, I love it because you get, like you've got here, you've got a community of lovely people who are sitting at home having their dinner or whatever mm. and it's you can you know you, you pin a page and you speak to somebody you talk to ask them how they are and then you play a couple of songs and i've had guests i've had um nile rogers had stephen fry um we had uh elvis costello we've had sting and gary barlow we've had quite a mixture of different people uh Don Don McLean even. Wow. Oh my God. And and they all said yes because they're sort of well, they must like you for one thing, but also, yeah, they're at home and it, you're you're doing something so positive. Yeah, and uh, you know, some of them are for different charities. That one with Don McLean and Nile Rogers, for instance, was for teen cancer cancer. But uh, I think the next one on the twentieth of March is gonna be brilliant as well i think it's going to be for the mind charity um and i'm reaching out to them now to um discuss who our special guests are going to be yeah i think my mind is an excellent charity um we were in, su in touch with some of them and they they even have us kind of an idling therapy which is like not a million miles away probably from what you're doing but chris let's just um wind up this section talk about what you're going to be up to in the coming months and years um You've had various gigs and tours cancelled and postponed. Uh, when do you hope to be getting out there on the road again? That's a very good question. We've had a socially distanced gig at the O2 book since October, and it keeps moving every month for obvious reasons. Uh, the next date that it's supposed to be is May, but what I heard from our agent yesterday, and they're going to move it again to June. I believe um, our tour with Hall and Oates um, in America, which we started last year, and um, we managed to get as far as Madison Square Garden in front of twenty-two thousand people, which was amazing. Oh, that had to stop. So all of our equipment is in a lockup in America, waiting for us to come back uh, to play the Hollywood Bowl and places like that. Um, now that's meant to be in August, and it really all depends on the rollout of the vaccine in America, whether that's going to be a possibility or not. And not only do we have to be safe and our road crew, but we want our audiences to be safe and we want them to be able to enjoy themselves and not to be separated. So um, we need to make sure that's going to happen. Most likely it will be next year. That's what my gut feeling is. So you, you don't think that, the audience, you don't want the audience to be in too much of a squeeze. <laughs> God. Sorry. Yeah. Um, uh, I'll just make up for that terrible joke by um, a second plug. <laughs> uh, so everyone, please do get this. Um, and, and what about writing? Have you got any, have you got a, a follow up in mind? I mean, did you enjoy the actual writing of that, of the autobiography? Um... It's a good question. I, I, I'd like to write some short sto stories using the titles of the big songs like Up the Junction, Call for Cats, Hourglass, that sort of thing. Um, and I went to Claire Colville, who I love, 
to help me with my book. He's, he's a literary agent, everybody. Literary agent. And I said, how do I go about writing a short sto sto story? Mm. And she said, you pick up a pen and start. <laughs> <laughs> so um, that was good advice. Uh, but I haven't done that yet. Um, the other thing I'd really want to do is finish off the, the musical that I've been working on. Oh, what's the musical? How much can you tell us about that? Well, um, it's based on The Odd Couple, um, but it's about two songwriters that live together rather than two journalists. But they're very similar characters to the people in The Odd Couple. Is it called Odd, O-D-D? Exclamation mark. <laughs> that was a better joke than the squeeze one. It was a better one, yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> thanks, Chris. Um, Victoria, should we go to some questions? There must be loads of people in the audience. Yeah, who want to there are that. absolutely loads, Chris. So we're going to go speeding on. And um, everybody be quite quick because um, I'll try and fit in as many of you as possible. Could we start with Ivor Randall and then Phil Danta, please? Ivor, are you there? If not, I'm going to ask uh, Claudia. Claudia, could you quickly ask your question and then Phil? Oh, hi, Chris. Um, so Big Squeeze fan and the song. We lost you, Claudia, we've lost you. Oh, no, can you no. hear me? Yep, good now. Um, uh, yeah, so, so uh, I love all your songs, but the one that resonates with me the most is um, last time forever so could you tell me a little bit about how how that came about last time forever was one of the first songs that glenn and i ever wrote oddly enough in 1974 <clears throat> and and we re uh, imagined it uh, in when we recorded the cozy fan Tutti album the story then changed slightly and it was about an airline pilot who had murdered his wife and put her in the bottom of a lake. And um, she was eventually found by um, somebody. And the reason they linked the two together was because he forgot to take uh, the dry cleaning off he bound her up in. And that was what linked it back to him. Now, I know you probably can't hear that in the lyric of the song, but that's what was going around in my mind at the time. Brilliant. Phil, you're not, have you got, um, Phil Danto, are you there? Chris, have you got any more wi any Wi-Fi sharing? Because you suddenly went a bit blurry just then. I'm here, don't worry. You're good. Um, Phil, will you ask your question? Sure. Hi, Chris. Um, now, I'm asking you a question about the music industry, but also how it affects songwriters. And we kind of all expect music industry executives to judge music almost exclusively on its commercial merit. But do you think songwriters today are also putting too much emphasis on how commercial their output is? And do you think you've written much better songs in recent years, maybe even last week, what you were saying, um, compared to those which were more commercially successful in the past? Well, that's a really great couple of questions and they're very much linked. Uh, I think the music industry doesn't exist anymore. I'm certainly not part of it. Um, I think they are greedy, mostly, and I think they are looking for commercialism. For instance, they're always talking about the reason why I pay Spotify for money over to artists is because they uh, spend all of that money on promotion of new artists. I don't believe that. As for me, uh, when I write a good song like the one I, I think I wrote last week, it's always better than any one I've ever written until it isn't. Right. So what, ah, now that's an interesting one. When does it get to the point where it isn't? And what's the criteria for judging that? Um, well, it, um, this is a lyric, so it needs to have music put to it before it becomes a song. So I can't really judge what it's going to be like until the music is, is linked to it and we start performing it. So is there, there must have been a lyric then that you've written that Glenn never really came up with what he felt was a good enough tune for what, and he thought that's such a, such a waste of a great lyric. 
No, I don't think so. I think at the time I may have thought that, but in retrospect, um, I look back at our songs and uh, even the ones that I thought were tough at the time, I now believe to be really great. And I think that was just because I was in a dark place or I wasn't listening. Brilliant questions, Phil. Thanks. Um, we're going to go back to Ivor in a second, but could we have Paul first? Because it's like your question, Paul, follows on from that subject a bit. And um, Chris, while we're getting Paul up, do you have anything else you're using Wi-Fi on? Because you are going a bit blurry occasionally. I don't think anything don't else think is so. being used. Brilliant. No. It's okay. All right. Paul, are you there? Yes. Hello. Great. Hi there. Your question. Hi, Chris. Um, you've said that you gave up writing music when you met Glenn, and but you released a, a demo album a couple of years ago when your book came out from 1972, and I recognised one of the songs as being a, a squeeze song, it, uh, Ain't You Sad Girl, um, which reappeared as like a bonus track. I think it was a Cool For Cats outtake, and it's exactly the same music and words, I think, more or less. So is that the only example of you writing music for Squeeze or are, are there any other exceptions that you can remember? No, before I met Glenn, I used to write music and lyrics together all the time. And that's kind of what attracted us to each other. Um, when we first went in the studio to record, we used some of those songs, um, but that was it. I, ne I didn't contribute musically at all uh, after that time after that very early time anyway. Well, yeah, I remember not songwriting so much, but I remember hearing or you, you said that you, you wrote the lead guitar for Cold Shoulder. Is that right? Uh, I did, I did um, write the uh, bass line for Cold Shoulder, but it was, you know, it was just one of those moments in the studio and I'm sure you know what that's like when you just kind of come up with something and it sounds good and you keep it and it becomes the main riff mm -hmm. it's not yeah. something plan it just happens to be there your I was just shirt, a, sorry your shirt is amazing by the way <laughs> oh yeah I d actually did not um I didn't wake up today and put throw this on and like <laughs> yeah I'm gonna talk to Chris because I completely forgot but I actually wore this yesterday <laughs> so uh, yeah, I'm giving away too much. Um, no, I just uh, wanted, wanted to ask that question because uh, obviously Chris, uh, Glenn has written lyrics in recent years, and I just wondered if you know there was any other examples of you know that getting mixed up a bit, or if you or if you're just lyrics really. Um, I'm just. I am a lyricist, and I enjoy that alone. Um, I've I've never bothered to go back to music for some reason. I don't know why. Fair enough. Paul, brilliant questions. Thank you. I'm going to move on to give a few other people a quick chance. Um, if you're there, Ivor, chip in. Otherwise, Hello, could we can, have... Can you yeah. hear me now? No, oh, good, I'm here. Hello, everyone. Hello. Hi, Ivor. Um, I think uh, in the original question, Victoria, I said we like your songs because they remind us we're not the only shrimps in the net. And we like that sort of sardonic, bitter um, laugh in the songs. But do you ever feel, do you feel you've ever written a happy song? I mean, I doubt they ever said, should we get Pharrell Williams or Chris Stifford to write this? But have you ever written a song you consider to be a happy song? Wow, that's very deep. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay. No, I mean, I'm, I'm happy when I'm writing. Hmm. Uh, oh, that, your songs don't, you know, your songs make us happy in various ways, but it's sort of, oh, yes, it's not only me that did that, or, oh, right, we're not alone. We all stuff up quite badly. Um, yeah, I, I think I'm not the kind of person that leans towards the happy when it comes mm. to lyric writing. Yeah. There we go, so but they make us feel happy anyway. I'm yeah, going to move exactly. on. I'm going to, uh, sorry to hurry you, but I want oh, to, to ask a brilliant question. Olivia okay. Browning, could we have you and then Graham Way, please? Hi, sorry, I'm speaking uh, for Olivia. Okay. Uh, so I, I was just uh, wondering about the acoustic guitar behind you. Um, whether you have any important stories about it or any other guitars that you've owned and um, what, what make the guitar behind you is or any other guitars that have been important to you in any way. Okay, that guitar is um, made by Alistair Atkin. He's a Lutheran who lives in Canterbury 
and at the beginning of lockdown i contacted him and said I, I, you know you can't believe this all my guitars are in lockup in new york because we were supposed to be on tour and i haven't got anything to play and he said i'm going to send you something and he did and here it is and here it will stay because it is amazing he does he makes great guitars brilliant thank you for that and graham Hello. Followed and then can we just get Des? Des, you ask a good question. You you get your stuff unmuted. Okay. Graham, go uh, for it. Sorry. Hi, Chris. Uh, I read an interview with Damon Albarn about how he liked to write lyrics that seemed simple or straightforward, but then he would chuck in a big or unusual word to throw the listener. I do a bit of songwriting myself, and I love it when an unusual word comes along. And I wondered if perhaps you do the same with something like it's my assumption, I'm really up the junction, because assumption is an amazing word to chuck into a song. And I wondered if you do that or whether it's accidental or uh, what your thoughts were about. Um, yeah, I like unusual words and they're only really good for me. Uh, I, I remember writing in America, a co-writing trip that I went on to write with various people. And I wrote, was writing with this guy who was extremely wealthy and written loads of hits. And uh, I tried to give him the word ironing board in the lyric and he just wouldn't <laughs> accept it. He just said that, you know, we won't have a hit with a lyric like ironing board. So that was the end of that. <laughs> Amazing. Thank you. Good question. Thank you. Thanks, Thank you. Graham. Des, you're ready. Yeah. Hi, Chris. Um, I, I just wondered what, what you've been listening to recently that you would recommend to us. And... Um, I, 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 we're all of a certain age, I think, probably here. I, I, I'm really conscious of the fact that um, I've got a 13 year old and she keeps me up to date with stuff. So I, I, I absolutely thought Billie Eilish and Phineas were the best thing of last year. But I just wonder what you think is. Well, <clears throat> that's a very good question. If I get my iTunes library up right now, which I'm just going to do, and I look at the songs that I've been listening to, Send in the Clouds by Barbara Streisand. Um, I'm Sorry by Brenda Lee, I Can't Make You Love Me, Bonnie Raitt. Um, these are the things that I've been listening to recently. Ken, Ken Dodd, the song Happiness. I love that song, it's so uh, optimistic. But I've also been listening to a lot of musical theater songs to try and understand uh, how they're paced. And Stephen Sondheim is somebody that I've been trying to study. Quite right. Uh, do, do you not prefer the Judy Collins version of Send in the Clowns? I always think she nailed that perfectly. Then. I think you're right. I think you're absolutely right. I just I downloaded that one because it was there. <laughs> oh, okay. we're all going to be listening to those songs now. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Chris. Could we have Jay Wayne? Your question, please. And then I think we'll have Mark Bick. Uh, hello, Victoria. Which which Hi. question? Oh, um, the, 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 the partnership question, please. Well, I think, I think Chris has answered it, actually, because I asked, I asked whether uh, he saw himself more in the, with Glenn as the Lennon McCartney model you did. or the Torpin John model. But actually, since Chris said he's, uh, he's now mainly the lyricist and, and Paul and John were both, I think it's, he's answered the question, more Torpin John. So can I just throw in another one? Go for it. He mentioned he's writing a musical of The Odd Couple, which I'm assuming is him and Glenn. So is he Walter Matthau or is he Jack Lemmon? <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God, that's such a teasing question. <laughs> and I don't know the answer to it. I'm a bit of both, and so is Glenn, I'm sure. Yeah. Fair enough. Fair enough. Well, um, well, are, we, are we are we genuinely going to see that on on stage? Do you think it's going to happen? Probably not. Um, when somebody I spoke to somebody in Andrew Lloyd Webber's company, and they said to me, "You could start writing a musical now, but you might not see it in your lifetime." Because, because of lockdown, one of the reasons anyway is because theatres are <coughs> a block, um, and yeah. The, you know, it, it's going to be a long time before we get back to that. That's really sad. Oh, we'd love to see it. Well, I wish you would. Go. Can you not put it on just in a small venue like in Brighton? Well, we could do. We could, we could do it on Zoom. I'm up for it. I'll have a ticket. <laughs> put it on the village hall. You know, because they're they're not that difficult to put on musicals. 
No, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> oh, brilliant. OK, Mark, could you have your question, please? Hi, Chris. Um, I, I live in Harrogate, so I've been to your warehouse recording studios for, for a live gig. I went to see uh, Los Pacaminos. Paul Young and Co. And uh, you, you actually came on stage and joined mm -hmm. them for a song as well. Mm -hmm. um, it, it was a brilliant setup there. I loved the sort of friendly, intimate atmosphere. Fantastic for a live gig. But how did that whole setup come about? Was it just for your own use to record your own music, or is it a benevolent thing to bring other musicians in, or more of a sort of just practical setup? Um, well, it's no longer there. It's a block of flats. Um, ah. The person who was renting the space had all the dreams that you could imagine to um, run the event, but it, it really didn't happen for him or for anybody else, and so it closed. Oh, what a shame. It is a shame. And, and the whispering Bob Harris is no longer... Nobody is there. involved in it. I think it's now, oh. it's now um, residential. Oh. Uh, Great Chris, can I, okay. can I get in, Victoria, can I just butt in with something I meant to ask earlier, which is that, um, you know, in the old days, Chris, I remember that you, you, you spent a lot of time in the car, which you enjoyed, uh, driving around the country, and you would often do a gig and then drive back home that night rather than stay the night. Uh, and you got a lot of thinking done in the car and a lot of listening. Have you missed that being on the road, that car time uh, over the last year? absolutely completely missed it my car has been outside i've done maybe i, I mean i <clears throat> I, I live near brighton and the a23 for anybody who knows an, anything about roads a23 m23 is like my gateway to london and unfortunately i've not been anywhere near it um since probably may of last year so yeah, I really miss listening to the radio and being on my own in the car, time to reflect, time to think. So, uh, I, I, yeah, when things, when lockdown eases, I may just pretend to do a gig somewhere and just drive off with an empty suitcase and a guitar case with nothing in it and drive to South End and then come home again. You could just drive around the, the M25. That would be exciting. <laughs> <laughs> it would be in your company. Who would be my company? It, it would no. be very exciting in your company. Oh, I see. Yes, yes. Yeah. No, it would be good fun, yeah. <laughs> uh, we all want to get out of London, those of us who are here. Mm. Um, Deckian, I think the, this might be the last question, but Deck, Deckian, are you there? Oh, hi there, yeah. Um, hi, hi. Hi, Chris, yeah, it's Declan. Hi. It's an <laughs> Irish name, but a Rochdale accent. Um, yeah, I was just uh, actually wondering about the... I, I actually saw you guys play in Wexford in the Spiegel tent. Wow. Is that last year, I think, which is a bit of a full circle because I joined your fan club when I was 10. Oh. Got this envelope and it had a little uh, badge and a, a poster in it. So that was the first and only, only fan club I've joined. And it was nice to see you last year. But one of the things that actually struck me, apart from the, the fun that you had on stage was amazing and the band lineup you had was amazing. But the chord structures and the music was to me is unfeasibly complex. And I wondered that if you were writing lyrics and putting your own music to it, would you choose unfeasibly complex chord structures or would you choose, you know, this, the one, four, five type of standard stuff? Wow, that is such a brilliant question. I remember that gig extraordinarily well because uh, Jules was playing there the night after, I think. Yeah. So I left a little message for him in the dressing room. I won't say <laughs> what it was, <laughs> um, but yes, um, um, I love Glenn's writing, you know, I, on my social club, I'm going to put a link to my social club in the chat room, um, which is the gig that I do every other, other weekend. And uh, Beth Nielsen Chapman joined us last weekend and she covered a song called Woman's World. 
and from East Side Story, the Elvis Costello produced album. Now she um, said that the only thing that she found difficult was the chord structure. But what makes the song brilliant for me is the chord stru structure, the way it moves is so squeeze, it's so Glenn, it's so us. Um, that that's what makes us stand out from other people, I, I think. And when I do my own solo shows, I do uh, easier versions of the songs, if you like. I take some of the chords out. I know Glenn doesn't like that, but I take some of the chords out. And when I'm writing for my solo albums with people like Boo Hewardine, um, I try and keep it as simple as possible, simply because my voice can't take all the changes. Yeah, because they are unfeasibly complex. <laughs> so. Well, they are, but they're beautiful. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Very good questions. Thank you. A great team. John great Fawkes. Team. John Fawkes used to sit in the classroom with me. My God. Well, can, can we've got a question from John. Can we quickly, uh, well, let's quickly finish with John then. John, will you ask your question? I could do this all night. It's so much fun. Oh, <laughs> John. You've got to ask it. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you. Hi, Chris. Um, just want to uh, get, get, get to the point. I, I, I love songs more than anything that are about places like Penny Lane, Waterloo Sunset and stuff like that. So I just wonder with your great songs like King George Street and Peyton Place, places I remember from my youth, did you start out writing the song, thinking about how can I write a song about those places or did it just pop into your head? Oh, I can feature that place in as you were playing with the words. That's a really good question. Um, King's George Street, when I was writing the lyric, it was really a story about the street that I grew up on. So it had to be called King, King George Street when I got to the chorus. Peyton Place was a bit more manufactured because there had been a really poor soap opera called Peyton Place on television when I was a kid growing up and I decided that there would be a good title for a song and then when I sort of investigated there's only one house in Peyton Place so it was it was not like a very busy street <clears throat> but um, yeah I love doing that I think it's great to um, associate places I mean, American writers do it very, very well because they've got such gorgeous n names. Um, I remember Richard Thompson saying to me that, um, you know, who's going to write about the A303? But you can write, you know, you, but you can write Highway 61. It's like a terrific title for a song, but the A303 doesn't really match up, unfortunately. But I'll give it a go. Not many okay, writers it can do it, but it's great that you you have. So good on you, mate. Thank you. Well, nice you, to see you. You would be the man to do that, Chris. Uh, <laughs> him to the A three A three. I'll do that. I love that road, actually. 